Welcome to the Nancy Neuroanatomy series. Today we will be covering the tracts of the central nervous system. My name is Barnett Borbas and let's begin. Moving on to the learning objectives. We're going to start by understanding what a tract is, then moving on to the ascending tract and then the descending tract. We'll also cover brown saccade syndrome and how it affects the various tracts. So what is a tract? A tract is a bundle of neuronal axons which travel vertically um, within the central nervous system. This is in opposition to association fibers, which travel anteriorly to posteriorly and posteriorly anteriorly between any one of the lobes within the same hemisphere. And also in opposition to commissures, which travel anywhere between two hemispheres. Okay, so tracts are split up into ascending, carrying sensory information from the periphery to the central nervous system and descending, which carry commands from the central nervous system down to effectors. So here are the major ascending and descending tracts. On the left-hand side, you can see all the ascending sensory tracts, and on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the descending tracts. We'll be focusing on the corticospinal tracts. Uh, however, you can take a look at all the other tracts in the further reading material provided at the end. So ascending tracts um, can be split into conscious perception and unconscious perception. However, we'll be splitting them into the type of perception they carry. So on the left-hand side, you see proprioception, vibration, discriminative touch. And on the right-hand side, you see pain, temperature, and non-discriminative touch. To understand what discriminative touch is, is the ability to discriminate between two points on your skin and also the position of where you're being touched. Um, Non-discriminative touch is therefore the opposite. So, uh, discriminative touch, proprioception, and vibration are carried by the dorsal columns and the spinocerebellar tract, which are, we will be covering today. It's also carried by the spinal library tract, which we will not cover today, but you can access in the further reading. Pain temperature and non-discriminative touch are carried by the spinothalamic tract, which we will cover today, and three other tracts, as you can see here, which we will not be covering today, but again, you can look up in the further reading material. So to begin with the spinothalamic tract, the spinothalamic tract is, uh, consists of three neurons named first, second, and third order, and they ascend through the spinal cord. So the first order neuron comes in from the periphery with the detected um, pain, temperature, or uh, non-discriminative touch sensation and then synapses in the dorsal horn of the gray matter. At which point the second order neuron uh, passes forwards and uh, decussates, which means crosses over in the anterior uh, white matter of the um, spinal column right here. It'll then travel up in the spinothalamic tract um, all the way up to the medulla, at which point it's in the lateral lemniscus and continues to travel up in the lateral lemniscal system through the pons midbrain, synapsing in the ventropocerolateral uh, nucleus of the thalamus. The third order neurons then travel along the internal capsule and um, end up in the somatosensory cortex in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. Here's another quick diagram to just see where the la lateral lemniscal pathway is within the medulla, pons, as well as midbrain. Moving on to the dorsal columns, here we see the same three neurons, however a little bit different where they decussate as well as where the synapses occur. So these are the dorsal columns, which will be carrying the sensation for um, vibration, discriminative touch, as well as proprioception. This will enter the spinal cord same way through the dorsal root. However, it will ascend all the way up to the medulla where it will synapse in uh, the dorsal column nuclei. And at that point, those second order neurons will pass anteriorly in the medulla. And this is the medial lemniscal decussation in the anterior medulla. Uh, and continue up in the contralateral medial lemniscus all the way again to the 
uh, ventribus serolateral nucleus of the thalamus, where they synapse onto the third order neuron. From this point, they again pass through the internal capsule, going to the somatosensory cortex. So here we have a little bit um, of another diagram. There's two nuclei here, specifically in the medulla. One is nucleus cuneatus, and the other one is the nucleus gracilis. So this blue one here is the nucleus gracilis, and the pink one is representing the nucleus cuneatus. Uh, this is important because, in fact, the dorsal columns are somatotopically arranged in the sense that sensations from the legs travel in the medial part of the co uh, dorsal columns, whereas the uh, sensations from the arms and further up the body join in uh, laterally in the dorsal columns. Next up is the spinocerebellar tracts. This is the last of the sensory tracts we will be covering today. Uh, in fact, there are several spinocerebellar tracts. So it carries the exact same sensations as the dorsal, dorsal columns, which are proprioception, vibration, and discriminative touch. It carries, depending on the um, tract, they will um, carry the sensation in a slightly different way. So we'll start with the um, tract which carries the information from lowest down in the body, from the dermatomes of L3 to S5. This is the ventral spinocerebellar tract. So as you can see here in blue, the ventral spinocerebellar tract joins in, and at that point it will um, immediately synapse onto a second order neuron in the dorsal gray horn of the spinal cord, and that will decussate over to the other side at the same spinal level and ascend in the ventral or anterior spinocerebellar tract. It will go all the way up to the level of the superior pons, almost to the level of the midbrain, at which point it will pass via the superior cerebellar peduncle into the cerebellum, and at that point it will decussate one more time, uh, ending up on the ipsilateral side as the sensation originated from, which is in contrast to the two previous tracts we covered, where the sensory information ends up in the cortex of the contralateral side. The next tract is the dorsal spinocerebellar tract, which covers T1 to L2. It's here, this one here, which will again synapse um, in the dorsal gray horn of the spinal cord. And then the second order neuron will not decussate and go ascend all the way up in the dorsal um, or posterior spinocerebellar tract. And in the inferior cerebellar peduncle, it will pass into the cerebellum and stay ipsilateral to the origin of the sensation. The next tract we're going to cover is the cuneocerebellar tract here in blue that you can see right here. This one is a little bit different. It covers the sensation from C1 to C8. The first sort of neuron enters in via the dorsal um, root and immediately ascends to the lateral cuneate nucleus, which is in the caudal medulla next to the nucleus cuneatus and the nucleus gracilis, at which point it will then synapse onto the second order neuron, which will ascend slightly further and leave via the inferior cerebellar peduncle to um, go to the ipsilateral side of where the sensation occurred. Here's a little other diagram that you can take a look at. Um, these are all, the red ones are the second order neurons. The blue one here is the first order neuron. So as, you, as I mentioned before, this is the cuneocerebellar tract. Here we have the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and finally the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Okay, to cover the descending tracts. So these are tracts controlled by either conscious perception or unconscious perception. We will only be covering the con uh, those controlled by conscious perception, which is the corticospinal tract. Um, we will not be covering any of these tracts um, but they are involved in various stabilizing motions as well as locomotion, uh, including walking. So the corticospinal tracts consist of two neurons, the upper and lower motor neuron. In reality, the upper motor neuron is the only thing that really travels within the central nervous system. The lower motor neuron, while originating in the central nervous system, has the majority of its course in the periphery. 
it originates from the precentral gyrus, the primary motor cortex, and then descends via the internal capsule, as you can see here. Um, it then passes through the cruciferi of the midbrain, down through the pons anteriorly, and it is passing down in the pyramids. This is why it is also known as the pyramidal tracts. Here, the vast majority of the fibers, about 80% decussate, and then descend as the lateral corticospinal tract, and about 10 to 20% do not decussate and uh, descend as the ventral or anterior corticospinal tract, which then decussate at a lower level within the spinal cord. So in the end, motor function ends up on the contralateral side of where the signal originated from, meaning that your left cortex will be responsible for moving the right-hand side of your body. Here's a diagram of the uh, pons and medulla. And here are these little um, decussations that you can see highlighted. And I'll just put a little arrow of how they go. So about 80% follow this and decussate, and only about 20% descend and then decussate down in the spinal levels. So we will start with covering brown saccade syndrome, which is a spinal cord hemisection, and it uh, represents about 1% to 4% of uh, traumatic spinal cord injuries. Um, as you can see, it can be due to any kind of fracture of the vertebral body, either penetrating injury with a gunshot or a wound of some kind with a knife. We're going to cover how it would present next. I'm going to try to convince you that this is a medulla here, and these are two spinal cord cross sections. And if we imagine that this gray box is the damaged area due to the brown saccade syndrome. So first of all, we're going to look at what would happen to uh, proprioception, vibration, and discriminative touch from below. So that is the dorsal column system. And these blue arrows represent that. So you'd have no issues passing into the dorsal gray matter horn and then ascending up all the way until the level of lesion, at which point it will be impossible for um, sensation to pass any higher, which means that you will lose all proprioception, vibration, and fine touch of the same side of the lesion. This is important to say uh, because the decussation is higher up in the medulla. As opposed to this, uh, the green arrows represent the spinothalamic tracts, which decussate here in the anterior white matter. Therefore, you're always going to lose contralateral pain and temperature below the lesion. However, at the level of the lesion, if you imagine the green arrows coming across here, you will lose all sensation of pain, temperature, and non-discriminative touch. Finally, we're going to consider the motor, which are going to be represented here in red. Again, motor connections decussate in the pyramids of the medulla, and therefore will always be ipsilateral to the side of the lesion where you're going to lose your motor function. The other thing to consider is that below the lesion, you will not have input from the descending motor neurons, which are in fact mainly inhibitory in nature, which leads to the final red arrow here, uh, representing the lower motor neuron being excessively activated, leading to a spastic paralysis. However, at the level of the spinal cord injury, the lower motor neuron is similarly injured, which leads to a flaccid paralysis at that level, but still ipsilateral to the side of the lesion. So in summary, you will have ipsilateral spastic paralysis below, ipsilateral flaccid paralysis at the level of the lesion, ipsilateral loss of proprioception, vibration, and discriminative touch below the lesion, and contralateral loss of pain and temperature below the lesion. Thank you for listening. If there is any further reading material that you may want to have a look at, uh, these were the resources that I used to make this presentation. And here are some acknowledgements for the diagrams that I have used and also some other resources that you may want to take a look at.
Thank you very much.